My first stop on my Civil War tour was, quite fittingly, the site of the first major scene of combat in the whole war, the Battle of Manassas, fought on July 21st, 1861. My friend Jonathan needed a ride back to Richmond, and as we made our way down there together, we stopped at Manassas. Not unlike how Union General Erwin McDowell and his troops had made a stop here on their way from Washington, D.C. to Richmond. Of course, their reasons for stopping here were far more sinister. A relatively small gathering of Confederate forces had been ordered to keep the Union Army from seizing the Confederates' recently selected capital city of Richmond, Virginia. Taking this city was the ultimate priority for the Union Army throughout much of the Civil War. And once they finally achieved that objective at a bloody and fiery toll in 1865, the war had officially reached its conclusion. Four years before that great triumph for the Union, however, their forces confronted and succumbed to this early display of Confederate defenses 25 miles south of Washington, D.C. Although the Union had the numerical superiority, as would be the case throughout most contexts of the war, McDowell's forces had been hastily assembled and were mostly inexperienced. In any case, they proved to be wholly ineffective at smoldering the rebels, and the outcome of this battle, 2,700 Union dead versus 2,000 Confederate dead, guaranteed that this push to contain the wave of secession would be no mere skirmish. Of course, all this information and much more would be conveyed to us once we made our way into Manassas National Battlefield Park right off of Sudley Road. Our knowledgeable park ranger shared plenty of fascinating knowledge about this 1861 battle. For instance, I learned that the Union came to call it the Battle of Manassas because they tended to label sites of combat after the cities they were featured in or near. The Confederacy, meanwhile, called it the Battle of Bull Run because they labeled the same sites based on the rivers that ran through them, which reflects how much they valued rivers for the industrial strength they granted their cause. Our guide also did a great job recounting the significance of the Henry House. The Henry family was still occupying this house as the battle unfolded around the same hill, and Judith Carter Henry was mortally wounded as Union artillery came crashing through her bedroom. Going inside this house is one of the most moving parts of the visit to Manassas, given the window it provides into just how badly civilian life was disrupted by this four-year conflict. And of course, it's hard to forget the towering statue of Thomas Stonewall Jackson that stands on these fields. It was during this battle, after all, that the famed Confederate general would earn his immortal nickname, given that he and his outnumbered forces withstood the Union assault like a stone wall throughout the day. After leaving the main battlefield grounds, Jonathan and I toured some of the gravestones and other landmarks strewn around the rest of the park. And that's how a very moving and engrossing first stop of the Civil War tour wrapped up. Now it was time to carry on to Richmond, where even more fascinating discovery awaited. <laughs> I helped Jonathan settle in in his place in Richmond, and then we grabbed dinner and caught a live jazz show together, which was an excellent way to unwind after a busy day of travel and sightseeing. The next day, I dropped Jonathan off at a bus station and then was free to make my way around town and check out the sights. As the former Confederate capital and focal point for much of the American slave trade, Richmond is ripe in powerful and unsettling history. It was my goal for the day to consume as much of it as possible, and boy was I in for a thrill. As a warm-up, I biked around town a bit and made my way to Monuments Avenue, which is dotted with statues and memorials to the likes of Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson Davis, and Jeb Stewart, as well as one of Arthur Ashe, a tennis legend from Richmond. These statues have always been controversial, and that only intensified after the violence in Charlottesville in 2017 which was spawned by the attempted removal of statues of this nature. I will also add that it's quite eye-opening to drive a mere two hours from Washington, D.C., where there is nothing but statues of Union generals, down to Richmond, where the exact opposite is true. That is very telling, as you can imagine. I kept on riding my bike, which allowed me to take in some of the remarkable displays of street art murals that exist all over Richmond and made my way to the Virginia War Memorial, a shrine to the 12,000 Virginians who have fallen throughout U.S. military history. 
The inside exhibition, Arms for the Nation, features weapons and uniforms from various conflicts dating back to the American Revolution, as well as detailed descriptions as to how Virginia and its fighting forces were specifically impacted by each of these wars. Given the theme of the trip, I kept an especially close eye on the Civil War section of this exhibition, but it was certainly valuable to get a sense as to how the Civil War fits in with the broader narrative of Virginia's wartime past. It only took a short bike ride for me to make my way from the War Memorial to the practically adjacent American Civil War Museum, located just a short ways down the James River. Once I was there, I got to enjoy a very thorough collection of items from throughout this era, together with descriptions as to how every section of America at the time, the North, the South, and the enslaved, were affected by various events in the Civil War timeline. Insight as to how the cotton gin's arrival at the turn of the century dramatically influenced the growth of slavery in America was one of the most unsettling three-way bits of insight that the collection provided to me. Right outside, my tour continued with a walkthrough of the historical site that the museum had purposely been constructed next to, the Tredegar Iron Works. Our guide, also named Josh, did a great job highlighting the significance of this factory to the war. Namely, it's largely because of Tredegar that Richmond was selected as the capital of the Confederacy. They needed a spot with the industrial capacity to fuel their war effort, and roughly half of the machinery used by the Confederacy throughout the war came straight out of Tredegar. Josh described how a variety of free, enslaved, and foreign workers worked regularly at these ironworks. Shoveling coal into furnaces, he said, in much of the same manner as the men we see in the boiler room in the movie Titanic. They ultimately produced over a thousand pieces of artillery there throughout the war. Tredegar largely survived the destruction of Richmond in 1865 and remained active as an industry through the mid-20th century. Some of the machinery on the grounds had even been used as late as the Korean War. What a staggering history lesson all that turned out to be, but more was still to come. I biked uphill to the Virginia Capitol grounds, which, like Monuments Avenue, are dotted with statues of controversial figures. Not just Confederate generals, but also Harry Byrd Sr., the Virginia senator who led a massive resistance against the desegregation of the state's public schools in the 1950s. A clearly deliberate counterbalance comes in the form of the Virginia Civil Rights Memorial, installed right next to the Bird statue in 2008. The afternoon was ticking by, but I squeezed in a visit to the White House of the Confederacy in the Court End neighborhood. Jefferson Davis and his family had made their way up here from Montgomery, Alabama, the original Confederate capital, in August 1861, and they would remain there for the rest of the war. Davis was both an important statesman and a family man, and both of these qualities are reflected in his Richmond estate, from the at-home office where he carried out his duties to the bedrooms where he stayed with his wife Verena and their five children, two of whom were born in this White House. After all of that memorable sightseeing came the most stirring part of the day and an ultra-high point of the entire trip, the Richmond Slave Trail. It was imperative for me to take in as much as I could about the practice that would destroy millions of lives and ultimately spark the war that I was committed to absorbing to the fullest on this trip. And it turned out that the brainchild of the Richmond Slave Trail Commission in 1998 would provide the ideal outlet for that very objective. I crossed the James River and began the trail at the former site of the Manchester Docks. Here, slave ships would arrive to unload their captives, who then were sent across Virginia and other parts of the U.S. Around 2 million slaves were shuttled through Richmond in this manner, making the city the largest slave trading center in the Upper South during the antebellum era. Imagining giant slave ships passing by the river right in front of me proved to be quite emotionally difficult, and it only got worse as I continued on the trail and learned more of Virginia's role in this gruesome process of human trafficking. It was a relief to finally read the signs describing the rise of the abolitionist movement and the ban on the import of new slaves to America in the early 19th century, although the established system of slavery within the country would endure right up until 1865. But once I crossed the river back into downtown Richmond, I once again was plunged in the heartbreak as I came across the former sites of a slave auction house and the gallows where Gabriel Prosser was hanged in 1800. Like Malcolm X much later, Gabriel had done away with his last name, recognizing that it had been assigned to him so as to designate him as his master's property. He had led a less bloody Nat Turner-like rebellion that ultimately resulted in his execution. 
Not until the 21st century did U.S. Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia officially pardon Gabriel for his unjust treatment. One of the few uplifting moments from this extraordinary trail was seeing the Slavery Reconciliation Statue, part of an international project done by former slaveholding nations. After consuming so much history in just a few hours, I had to hit up the camel bar for some live music to properly unwind. There was way too much Civil War knowledge in Richmond for me to consume in just one day, I had to stay another. I started my day at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. It's the only stop on my trip that day that wasn't strictly Civil War related, but it's such a cool museum that I couldn't resist. Plus, they had a limited run exhibition on Napoleon, with all kinds of beautiful 19th century material on loan from the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal. To keep everything balanced, I did check out a couple of the BMFA's Civil War era artwork including the 1866 John Rogers statue, faking the oath, and drawing rations. I also visited the Confederate Memorial Chapel that exists right by the museum grounds. I then returned to Tredegar and entered the visitor center that serves as the collective gateway to all the landmarks in Richmond National Battlefield Park. All kinds of items on display tell the story of the Civil War in chronological order, while clearly communicating that the war very much remains the central event in the life of the nation. In addition, some of the 150-year-old stone foundation of the Confederate structure at Tredegar is visible at the front entrance. One of the most stirring features of this site is the remnants of the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad Bridge, which allowed for industrial material to be transported to and from the Tredegar Ironworks. The Confederate Army set fire to this bridge in April 1865, in a last-ditch attempt to save the city from the upcoming Union attack. It was quite moving to walk down the wooden boardwalk and see the charred remnants of that bridge just down the river, while illustrative panels describe the whole story of the bridge's life and destruction. My last stop in Richmond proper was at the Museum of the Confederacy, adjacent to the White House. The museum features a comprehensive chronological overview of all the major battles in which the Confederate Army took part. There was also no shortage of flags on display here either. While the quote-unquote Confederate flag that everybody thinks of is the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia used by Robert E. Lee and his troops, this museum demonstrated that there were all sorts of variants used by different sections of the Confederate society and military, as well as the national flag of the Confederacy issued in 1861. After wrapping up at that museum, I realized that, although there were many battlefield sites to see on the outskirts of Richmond, I would only have time to do one before dark. I wound up going with Malvern Hill. On my way, I made a brief stop at Glendale Cemetery, which was initially built for victims of the nearby Battle of Malvern Hill, but now features over a hundred years worth of further burials. Then, onto the battlefield itself. Here in Henrico, Virginia, I felt as deep in the middle of bloody nowhere as it is possible to be. Upon closer look, though, it turns out that I was at a site of great power. In the spring of 1862, 120,000 members of the Army of Potomac, of later Gettysburg fame, were ferried down to the southeastern tip of the Virginia Peninsula and sent up to capture Richmond. If they had succeeded, the Confederates might have promptly surrendered, just as occurred when the capital city finally fell in April 1865. Only in such a scenario, the Civil War would have resulted in a relatively minor nine-month skirmish rather than the bloodiest conflict to ever take place on American soil by a light year. Instead, Confederate forces led by various generals held their ground against the Union in what became known as the Peninsula Campaign. Finally, the most famous of all these generals, Robert E. Lee, took the offensive during the Seven Days Battle from June 25th to July 1st. The vast empty field I had driven to was the site of the final scene of combat of the Seven Days Battle at Malvern Hill. The Union's superior artillery and coordination seriously overwhelmed the Confederate troops, 
led by Lee's comrade, General John Magruder. But in spite of that day's victory, Union General George McClellan proved exhausted by the withering combat of the past week, during which time the Union had taken over 15,000 casualties. He decided the Peninsula Campaign was a lost cause and whisked his remaining troops back north, thereby ending the largest operation in the eastern theater of the war up until that point. A bar in D.C. near the George McClellan statue on Connecticut Avenue is cleverly named McClellan's Retreat in reference to this costly withdrawal. All of this stunning history is accessible by the one and a half mile walking trail in the park. Some of the earliest points of interest I passed were an old furnace and, as I entered the woods on my bike, the former burial sites of multiple Confederate victims of the battle, denied the honor of a proper burial that other victims were later recorded at the nearby Glendale Cemetery. Coming out of the woods, I saw rows of cannons on wheels positioned to roughly resemble the lines of both armies. This gives the viewer a rough idea of what the scale of the attack might have been on that day. That just about wrapped up my visit to the desolate but dramatic scene of July 1862's violence. Now it was back to the car and off to Pocahontas State Park, just a short ride away to camp out for the night. Good morning, Virginia! At nearly 8,000 acres, the largest state park in VA is a great gateway not only to tons of natural beauty, but also to at least three eras of history from three different centuries. It's named for Pocahontas, who lived not far from there in Lower Virginia in the early 1600s. Its 60 plus miles of trails were established by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the New Deal era. And the park is only a short ways from the Petersburg National Battlefield Park making it of considerable interest to Civil War enthusiasts such as myself. After a great night of camping and some gorgeous bike riding around the park, I was back in the car and off to the battlefield, roughly a half hour away. I stopped at a few excellent hidden gems along the way. The first of these was Drury's Bluff, which is one of the defenses the Confederates intelligently installed along the James River in the hopes of repelling an eventual Union assault on Richmond. That strategy was put to the test in 1862 during the Peninsula Campaign, when five Union warships were sent up that river, including the famous USS Monitor. These ships took heavy fire from Jewry's Bluff, also known as Fort Darling, and were forced to turn around. I broke off from I-95 to learn more of this story. It was pretty cool to snake my way through the grass-covered mounds that represented former barricades, and seeing the cannon still positioned out towards the James River is totally fascinating and succeeds marvelously at making the scene of naval combat come alive in your mind. One last stop before I reached the main battlefield was Fort Harrison, which the Union later renamed Fort Burnham in honor of Brigadier General Hiram Burnham, who was killed during the initial assault on the fort on September 29, 1864. Despite the loss of Burnham, the assault was successful, and the fort was soon secured by 2,500 Union forces. Lee's attempt to reclaim the fort the following day was unsuccessful, and the Battle of Fort Harrison represents a triumph for the Union in the wildly uneven Overland Campaign of 1864. That same campaign was immediately followed by the nine-month Siege of Petersburg, from June 1864 to April 1865. After highly costly losses in the battles of Spotsylvania, the Wilderness, and Cold Harbor, General and future President Ulysses S. Grant was forced to swing down south and concentrate his army at Petersburg, where industrial resources and the railroads of Richmond provided the lifeblood of the Confederate Army. Capture Petersburg, Grant reasoned, and Richmond would soon follow. Much easier said than done, though. The Confederates rebuked the initial assault on Petersburg, and General Lee, realizing that he had to absolutely defend the city at all costs or else lose the war, installed a vast network of fortifications around the town. Grant wound up establishing trenches of his own across the way and poured tens of thousands of members of the Army of the Potomac into them. 
The resulting nine months were excruciating misery for all involved. Unfathomably boring for the most part, but punctuated by instances of terrifying violence. Worst of all during the Battle of the Crater on July 30th. But although the Union actually suffered more casualties than the Confederates throughout this affair, the former had the luxury of being continuously replenished with food, supplies, and backup troops. The latter, meanwhile, was worn down to the point of exhaustion and starvation. That condition, and the Union's numerical superiority, proved to be all too much for them to bear. Lee finally abandoned his post and withdrew the Army of Northern Virginia on April 2, 1865. Within the next two weeks, Richmond would be ravaged, Lee's army would flee and be hunted down, an unconditional surrender would be issued, the Civil War would end, and Lincoln would be assassinated. A whirlwind two-week period like none other in U.S. history. When I arrived at Petersburg, I started off at the Visitor Center, where this general narrative is conveyed quite well. Nearby were a number of cannons and a massive siege mortar called the Dictator, a 17,000-pound weapon that could hurl a 218-pound shell across two and a half miles, all while storing 20 pounds of powder in its hull. Quite the formidable weapon, in other words. I then hopped into the car and enjoyed my driving tour of the eastern front of the battlefield. The road wound through the woods, with batteries and forts featured here and there. I especially remember the spiky recreation of the trenches from that era. They gave a clear sense of how difficult it must have been to try and penetrate these fortifications. And you can also see why Petersburg is often described as a preview of the horrors of World War I that would arrive 50 years later. After leaving the woods, I was back out in the open and at the site of one of the most famous episodes from the Siege of Petersburg, the Battle of the Crater on July 30th, 1864. Some coal mining engineers from Pennsylvania had dug a 500-foot tunnel right up underneath the Confederate defense line. After packing the tunnel with four tons of dynamite and lighting the fuse, the resulting explosion devastated the rebel army. It looked as though the chance for the Union to advance after weeks of a wearying stalemate had finally arrived. Petersburg was one of the most prominent destinations for the United States colored troops throughout the war, and a division of specially trained black soldiers was prepared to lead the attack. But with the memory of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment's disastrous assault on Fort Wagner only about a year old, General George Meade of Gettysburg fame instead ordered a white division to go first, with the black soldiers following in the second wave. A safer move politically, though not strategically. The white soldiers had not been well informed of the nature of this attack and ran through the crater expecting to confront the Confederates head on rather than run on the edges as they should have. As a result, they became hopelessly trapped at the bottom, too clustered and disorganized to turn around well. Once the rebel survivors regrouped after the explosion, the Union soldiers were at their non existent mercy. The Battle of the Crater was a disaster for the Union. They lost 3,800 soldiers to the Confederacy's. 1500 without advancing whatsoever. Driving through stop 8 of the Eastern Front driving tour took me right through the scene of this horrific episode. Despite the 95 degree heat, I enjoyed walking across the field where the crater had been created by the explosion. Lots of the terrain is still visibly punctured as a result. I also found myself constantly thinking of the film Cold Mountain, which opens with the events of July 30th, 1864, at this very location. Afterwards, I visited the nearby Polar Grove and Blandford cemeteries, filled with victims of the nearby siege, as well as Old Town Petersburg, where some of the old railroad junctions offer reminders as to why this site was so attractive for the Confederates to operate from and for the Union to attack. I then had about an hour's drive ahead of me before I arrived at Twin Lakes State Park. I was then able to camp out and get ready to discover what would inevitably occur after the loss of Petersburg in April 1865. The unconditional surrender of Robert E. Lee's army at Appomattox only a week later. 